jumping just so I don't forget. Hey, everybody, thank you for being here. If you want to, you know, say hello in the chat, tell us where you're calling in from. If you already have something that you're really excited about learning about, you can go ahead and tell us that too. Um, I'm going to read off where people are calling in from. And also, um, this is being recorded. So just so you all know that you have that disclaimer. So anything you put in the chat or any questions you may pose will be read out and will be included in the recording and could be distributed afterward. Um, but that, hopefully that doesn't stop you from engaging. Um, we really want you to be conversational in the chat, to put your questions in there. If you select all panelists and attendees, um, everybody is able to um, see what you said and hopefully correspond with you. And we got people from all over calling in. We got Fredonia in New York, Northern Virginia, Swanee River in Live Oak, Florida. I've been to Live Oak, very cool. Uh, someone from Oregon, Pinewood, South Carolina, um, Detroit, Central Missouri. All right, we got quite the distribution. This is great, Southwest Florida. San Diego, Maryland, Houston, Texas. Cool stuff. Um, and I'm Caroline from the SciStarter team. We're really delighted to um, co-host this webinar today with uh, the National Environmental Education Foundation in honor of Citizen Science Month. There are over 100 Citizen Science Month programs available at citizensciencemonth.org. And we're so delighted that you chose to come to this one called Getting Your Citizen Science Project Off the Ground. I'm gonna pass the mic to Robert, who's gonna do our introduction today. Thanks, Caroline. Welcome, everyone. Today, we kick off National Environmental Education Week 2021, NEEF's annual celebration of environmental education. This year's celebration focuses on three topics that are salient to NEEF's Greening STEM initiative, biodiversity, citizen science, and climate change. My name is Robert Sendry. I am the program director for K-12 environmental education at NEEF. Today's webinar, Getting Your Citizen Science Project Off the Ground, is being co-hosted by our friends at SciStarter.org. Today's presenters will walk through uh, viewers through the process of creating, developing, and implementing a citizen science project. Viewers will walk away with a basic understanding of a few of the resources and platforms that exist to make, a cre make creating a citizen science project easy and accessible. With us today, we have Caroline Nickerson, uh, who you've, you've just met. She's the SciStarter Program Manager. We have Jessica Taylor from NASA Langley Globe Partnership, and she's the Lead and Principal Investigator for Globe Clouds. Hi, Jessica. We also have Susan Sachs, the Education Branch Coordinator at Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And we have Sean O'Connor, Citizen Science Program Manager at BSCS Science Learning. So to get us started today, we're going to turn things over to Caroline. All right. Thank you, Robert. And thank you to all the other speakers. I can't wait to learn from you. Um, I'm a big citizen science enthusiast. So one reason why we're here, it's um, we get to kick off National uh, Environmental Education Week, which is awesome. And it's also Citizen Science Month. A lot of really good things are happening this April. Um, so I know some of you are all, maybe in different places with your citizen science projects. Maybe you've already started one. Maybe you're just thinking about starting one. Uh, maybe you're just engaging in citizen science as an in individual. So. Um, for my little kickoff here, I'm going to try to address all of you, um, and I hope each one of you, no matter where you are with whatever citizen science project you have, you get something out of it. Um, so Citizen Science Month, which is going on right now, is supported by the Network of the National Library of Medicine, the All of Us Research Program, and SciStarter. And you might be wondering, what's SciStarter? You may not have heard of it before. Um, I always like starting with this. Millions of people enjoy science and nature. And at SciStarter, we're privileged to have over 100,000 of them as registered SciStarter users, in addition to millions of other site visitors. And some of the folks who come through SciStarter, I'll hear people say things like, wow, I never even knew that I like science. But if they like going outside, if they're curious about the world around them, if they like looking up at the night sky, or if they've ever pondered how the brain works, then they like science and nature. And citizen science can be a gateway to um, science engagement for all sorts of different folks. It's um, really a conceptual innovation when people realize that they can meaningfully be a part of science and move science forward, um, no matter who they are, where they are, what background they have, how old they are. Um, so millions of people enjoy science and nature. And that's one reason why SciStarter works and citizen science works in general. 
um, because there's the appetite for it because people care about this stuff. And the, the other, the, another piece of good news, thousands of scientists need volunteers. So some of you who are watching today may be researchers or maybe your program managers or maybe you're looking to engage your community in an ongoing project. Well, this is good news for all of you. There's science that couldn't be done without the help of members of the public. One thing we say at SciStarter is scientists don't have enough eyes, ears, and perspectives to know everything there is to know, to answer every question that needs to be answered, uh, to understand the world around us. We're so much stronger together than we would be apart. So that's another um, great thing about citizen science. Um, people just like you and me um, can analyze data or collect data information for an ongoing research project to help them find patterns, to help them garner some sort of data informed understanding to answer a particular question about the world. But sometimes they can't find each other. These people who are so passionate and wanna make a difference can't find the researchers that need their help. That's where SciStarter comes in. We connect them. We connect you to the real science you can do. And if you're a researcher or a program manager, we connect you to the volunteer communities you need to make a difference so you can collaborate with them uh, to make the world a better place and to do some real science. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to citizensciencemonth.org because that's where this program was listed as well as hundreds of program, hun over 100 programs and featured projects from all over the world. But there's also the main SciStarter website as well. So to kind of finish my definition of what citizen science is, it's a collaboration between researchers and those of us who are curious, concerned and motivated to make a difference. So it's a, how people can make an impact on the issues they care about and help science. Our, one way we like to say it at SciStarter, citizen science allows you to turn your curiosity about the world into real impact. I'm actually gonna skip this video for time. So when you go to SciStarter, this is the main website that you're hit with. So there are over 3000 projects, events and tools that people have added. And um, as I told you all earlier, there are over 100,000 registered SciStarter users um, who can keep track of all the different science they're doing in their SciStarter dashboard. Um, and one misconception I get a lot is people think that all these projects are actually hosted on SciStarter. That's not the case. Most often, folks add a project to SciStarter or they add a tool or an event to SciStarter and you go somewhere else to engage in it. Um, but that's not all, right? So SciStarter isn't just a project director. We have programs that we do. We have evaluation tools. In fact, at the end of this, I'm gonna be asking you all to fill out a survey to evaluate me. Um, we work in um, societal, economic and cultural contexts. Um, we um, do research on our own platform to understand what different projects people are joining and a, a kind of meta, right? We wanna do citizen science about the field of citizen science itself. So it's not just a project directory. Um, there are other things that build off of that, but that's really the core of SciStarter. So um, many of you, I know that part of this audience is interested in creating citizen science projects right away. If you wanted to make sure to, you reach participants, you could add your project to SciStarter. If you just want to host an event, maybe you're, you're just getting into citizen science and you're participating in some existing projects like Globe Observer, for example, that could give you um, insights into how citizen science work. It works, you can add events to the, 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 um, the project finder, the event finder. Um, I've seen events come in from all sorts of different places. There's a faith community in Chicago, um, a mosque, that they picked a featured citizen science project from Zooniverse and they all just got together on Zoom and they did the project together. And they added that event to SciStarter. So you don't have to be running a project to you know, organize a citizen science program and event or event. You could you know, get an already existing project or platform and plan your event around that. Or you might add a tool. And a tool doesn't have to be a physical thing, though a lot of people will you know, add tools people can build, borrow, or buy to our tools database. But sometimes it's more of like a data analysis tool that you can add to SciStarter for folks to discover. Um, so I think the utility for you all is that, you know, as individuals, you can make accounts and discover projects and keep track of them. But as program managers and researchers, you can reach volunteer communities through SciStarter. Uh, so that's the project finder I mentioned. Um, when you're adding your project, try to put um, different fields in there. I know a lot of educators use SciStarter, so if, you are, if you're making classroom materials for your project, make sure you note that when you add it. Um, so te educators, teachers um, from all over the world can self-select into that. 
you can be hyper focused. You can say my project is just for this, this particular location, this latitude and longitude, this stream, or you could be really broad. Maybe you have a global project where you're asking people from all over the world to monitor plastic pollution. Um, whether you're hyper local or you're global, you could add your project to SciStarter and you can add different tags to help the right people find your project. So they can turn their curiosity into impact and you're reaching the volunteers who can help you. Um, so this is what it looks like when a participant has a dashboard. This is my dashboard. Um, you might be wondering, um, wow, I've joined a lot of projects. Yes, I have participated in 81 projects. Um, and I've contributed 442 times to affiliate projects. And this might not be as relevant for you all as at the start, but as your project gets more established, or if you want SciStarter to move it into some of our um, special curated volunteer programs, like with the Verizon Corporation or the Girl Scouts, um, you can use our affiliate tools. They're free. They are supported by the NSF for us to create that program, and it just tracks everything in the back end. So every time I contribute to a SciStarter affiliate project, I'll use the example of IC Change. Um, every time I post an observation about climate change to the IC Change project, I see the number and frequency of my contributions in my SciStarter dashboard. Um, and if you all are interested in the affiliate program, I can get more into that. Um, we also have a project leader dashboard. This will probably be the most relevant for you all. I think of, of this, the most useful tool in the project leader dashboard, of course, you can message people who have joined your project on SciStarter and give them different calls to action. And you can also reach new folks by using our people finder. Um, so you can just select an area on the map and you can message all the folks in that area. So I've selected for New York City here and there are 4,103 SciStarter users in New York and I'll period in, in the greater New York area, I'll periodically message them and say, hey, you know, New York Botanical Garden is doing a citizen science program where people are digitizing collections. Make sure you come by. Um, so that's a useful tool for you as well. And the volunteer manager, I mentioned that you can message folks. Um, and I know I'm almost out of time. So I wanted to talk about some, because I know that this audience is really interested in understanding why things work and how things work and all that good stuff. We're thoughtful about that SciStarter as well. And through our partnerships with North Carolina State University, um, Arizona State University and others, we're trying to understand the landscape of projects and what motivates people to stay or change projects. And we found some really interesting things. Um, I, most people tend to do three projects on average when they have a SciStarter account. And it's um, really unpredictable like what they'll end up joining. Um, it's not, a, you may think, oh, you know, this person did Cocoa Raws, they must love monitoring rain. I bet you they do another water-based project. Um, one thing the NC State folks found is people who do cocoa raws also tend to do the stall catchers project where they're accelerating Alzheimer's research. So there are all sorts of different patterns of participation to ponder. Um, and that's one benefit of the affiliate tools. And we really believe in the idea of growing by connecting. So by adding your project to SciStarter and becoming part of this ecosystem and this community, um, your participants will probably do your project, but they also might discover other projects and just become part of a, a world of volunteer work that lifts all of us up and helps all of us grow. Um, and I wanted to include a testimonial from Pietro Michelucci. He's found almost all of his participants, the majority, um, they originate from SciStarter. Um, and that's because, you know, we do promotion, we have our Discover Magazine blog, and we do what we can to spread the word, but also just people in that project finder digging around and investigating. Um, so as a reminder, it is Citizen Science Month. We do have special programs surrounding that, special resources, especially for libraries and all sorts of different featured projects. And you can participate as a researcher, as a community leader, or as an individual. By the end of the day, um, we just want you to do citizen science. Um, we're here to help at SciStarter. And even though I'm doing a big push for April right now, it's really citizen science year. It's not just citizen science month. We do it every single day of the year. Um, so we'd love to be a resource to you and help you. Thank you so much. And now I'm going to pass the mic to our next presenter and back to Robert to introduce them. Thanks, Caroline. Uh, perhaps uh, you mentioned something and, and folks have follow up questions. Uh, please feel free to submit them to the Q&A. And uh, if time permits at the end, uh, we'll answer as many as we can. And uh, the ones we don't get to, we'll try and follow up with folks if you include some contact info. All right, uh, so uh, if you're looking for existing science citizen projects, SciStarter is a great place to start. Uh, and you'll find that there are several Globe Observer uh, projects listed there. So next up, we're gonna hear from Jessica Taylor a little bit more about Globe. 
Well, hello, everyone. Thanks so much for inviting me to this. Um, indeed, many GLOBE projects are featured on SciStarter. And um, that's a great place to find, um, as Caroline mentioned, a bunch of different citizen science programs. Um, I've actually been involved in the GLOBE program for longer than I've been with NASA. So I got started in GLOBE in 2000 probably before the term citizen science was really big and, and used regularly. So um, I often think of it as volunteering to contribute to science. And Caroline went over um, actually a great definition and I really appreciated her use of the term uh, collaboration. Because when we think about the GLOBE program in particular, we're thinking about scientists, students, the general public, educators, community members, all working together. So here's a little bit more about the GLOBE program. Um, we began in 1994, so if you do that math, Earth Day is our birthday, and uh, we'll be uh, turning 26 and very excited about everything uh, that we've been doing. Um, that's when it was announced in 94 and began in 95. Um, there are actually many data collection protocols, so our scientific procedures for collecting, um, covering the Earth spheres, right? So we've got atmosphere, hydrology, um, pedosphere, as well as biosphere. There are over 120 participating countries. That's amazing. When we think of worldwide endeavors, um, it's definitely something that has continued to drive me and my participation of GLOBE is knowing that um, my data is comparable to somebody else around the world and getting a chance to interact with that person from another part of Earth. Um, over 150 million measurements now in the database. And that database is accessible to anyone who participates in the program, as well as just anyone who's interested, whether they are citizen scientists or professional researchers. Um, GLOBE itself did start with its basis in K-12 education and only recently expanded to um, communities and the general public. So in 2016, we released an app called GLOBE Observer where we hand selected um, some of these protocols to open it up for communities at large to participate in. Um, I did add a few logos on the bottom because I think it's important to note that um, while uh, NASA is the main sponsoring agency, but we receive a lot of federal agency support. So it's also supported by NOAA, National Science Foundation, and the Department of State, and it's implemented at University Corporation for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. So I'm going to focus today on the four tools in the Globe Observer app that you can use right now to start engaging in citizen science. And those are clouds, mosquito habitat mapper, land cover, and tree height. So uh, Robert mentioned, I actually lead the GLOBE clouds team. Um, so I might be a little biased in my review uh, because I lead this team and I've been as I said, I've been making cloud observations, uh, being a part of GLOBE since 2000. My major professor at Florida State was the PI for the GLOBE Clouds protocol way back when. And so um, it fills my heart that I'm able to continue um, participating in GLOBE in this way. So how you do this in the app? Well, the app itself is pretty awesome because it, um, if you turn on notifications and you turn on location services, we can geolocate you and you can automatically have your latitude and longitude identified. Um, in the image on the left, there's an orange button that says check satellite flyovers. This is where you can really get the NASA connection part of it. So my team helps um, curate this, uh, this database and you're basically calling our code. You put your latitude and longitude is automatically recognized in the phone and we'll tell you when some of our polar orbiting satellites, the ones that are going like this, are overhead that also have instruments on them that measure clouds. So your observations can be matched to NASA satellite observations. And so we can also notify you when a satellite is overhead. And what's pretty exciting is about three years ago, we added 
um, a lot more capabilities to do geostationary satellites, the satellites that sit right in one spot and kind of go with Earth. And so that means basically any time of day, anywhere on the globe, you can go outside and receive a satellite match back to us. And we don't necessarily think that your observations are always going to be with the satellite seas because you've got a totally different perspective. That's why it's valuable. You're on the ground looking up and the satellites in space looking down. These two perspectives combined actually help us get a better understanding of what's going on. So the next one that I want to mention is Mosquito Habitat Mapper. So at least right now, I know I'm feeling as though I need to go outside my house and start cleaning everything up and making sure I don't have any containers that can be contributing to any mosquito habitat whatsoever. And so through the app, it'll step you through, just like for all of these tools, how to identify the habitat, count it, and you can go a step further if you so desire. You can also identify the larvae itself. There's a pretty cheap microscope uh, that you can add to your phone to help you do that. The next one is land cover. So land cover, just what it sounds like, you are taking pictures. You were able to take pictures in clouds looking up. Now we're having you take pictures just slightly lower and looking at the landscape itself. And landscape might be um, ground trees. It could also be uh, water habitat as well. And so we want you to take photos. And in the tool itself, there's the opportunity to compare the images that you took to what the satellite sees overhead. And you can tell NASA directly if you see any differences in that satellite image compared to your observations on the ground. Again, you have different perspectives and you're using different instruments. Satellite is certainly using different types of instruments and you're using your eyes and your knowledge of the environment to help you identify your land cover. And last but certainly not least is tree height. This is really fun because it takes your phone and turns it into a clinometer so you can measure how tall the trees are. And um, this is probably one of the most fun ones I think there is to do because it's also fun to get a chance to really think about the trees around you and um, you can participate in counting the trees doing the tree height and you can go even further if you so desire and do some more of the biometry protocols so i mentioned trees and i would suggest if you have not yet participated in globe and are curious about it please join our trees challenge or a community tree challenge, which is going on right now um, through May 15th. And we have a number of resources that we've put together to help communities do this activity together. So if it's safe for you to go outside and make observations, please make observations. If it's not safe for you to go outside, we also have a number of different resources on here, including videos, at home activities, um, that you can learn about trees and all sorts of different um, engagements and opportunities to learn more about what NASA is doing to better understand trees, um, biology, and even specifically tree height through some of our satellites. Now, I know many of you are educators, and so I wanted to point out a couple of the educator resources. There are toolkits specifically for informal educators that we have on our Globe Observer website, observer.globe.gov slash toolkits. And these toolkits will include videos to how to do the observation in the app. It'll include videos on some of the science behind why you would, should be interested in this sort of thing and how your observation as a citizen scientist contributes to us, activities, and other promotional materials. Now, if you are uh, an, an educator and are looking to do even more in GLOBE, maybe even beyond the app, I encourage you to consider becoming GLOBE, become a GLOBE certified teacher, and you can do that any time of day through e-training. So e-training is available on globe.gov. And once you become a certified educator in GLOBE, it unlocks some additional um, opportunities, such as creating student accounts, um, joining some of the teacher resources like teacher water coolers, where teachers get together on platforms like Zoom and talk about how to implement GLOBE and how to implement other citizen science programs. Um, Teachers also have the opportunity to post student projects 
that's probably one of the most important things to me is seeing this feedback all the way to students actually doing a project. And you could submit data for other different protocols beyond those four tools, like surface temperature. So this is just a quick little screen grab of what it looks like. You download some slides and you take a very, very short assessment. And that's how you go through e-training. And I'm going to put this link in the chat when I'm done here, but this is kind of a pros and cons, why you might want to become a GLOBE certified teacher versus what you have available to you in the GLOBE Observer account directly as kind of your stepping stone. I mentioned student projects. GLOBE has long been a supporter of making sure you go all through a science research process from observing all the way to making sure you communicate what you have learned. And so there are opportunities to do that on GLOBE through the reporting function, the student research symposium, there's one in the United States, and also there's the international virtual science symposium um, that students around the world participate in. And our volunteer scientists serve as judges and communicate with those student groups. Um, the last thing that I want to show you is how you access the data. I mentioned that anyone can access the data and you can map it in the tools that we have where you can even see the photos directly. You can download that data and we have even an API that allows you to call that data if that's something that's of interest to you. So here is the last information of the websites to go to. I'm also going to add my email address just in case you guys have any other questions. Um, but looking forward to hearing from you and your questions, and thanks so much for considering joining this GLOBE community. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, as she mentioned, uh, if you have questions, please feel free to submit them to the Q&A. Uh, time permitting, we'll go over as many of them as possible before uh, we're done. And uh, if possible, uh, we'll follow up with folks uh, for questions that we didn't get to. All right. Well, there's a lot going on with GLOBE, uh, and I think the name fits um, the program well. Uh, but we're going to take a little bit of a, a closer look. Uh, next up is Susan Sachs from Great Smoky Mountains National Park, who uh, has pretty much made a career out of citizen science while working for the Park Service. So here to tell us a little bit more about her work, Susan. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Robert, for inviting me to be part of this panel and for the support, support from the uh, National Environmental Ed Foundation for our program. So uh, it's really been great. Uh, as he mentioned, yes, I do work in Great Smoky Mountains National Park, where it is a lovely spring day. Um, so hopefully you all are getting to enjoy spring wherever you are, if it has started yet. So I'm going to be focusing a little bit on um, how we use community science in the Smokies to lead to stewardship and in particular with youth. So as mentioned, um, community science or citizen science is actively engaging the public uh, who are not professional scientists. And for me, an important distinction of what makes uh, citizen science citizen science is that data part, it's really important. Uh, but even more important is that there's an education component and that education component could be for youth or it could be for adults. Um, but it is a really key important part of citizen science. Otherwise, I see it more as just volunteerism, which is a, certainly a wonderful thing in and of itself. But, you know, teaching people about uh, and connecting people to the issues of your area or of the globe or of the world. You know, why is it important to monitor clouds? Um, you know, is, is a really important connection for people to make. So I, I know that all the great programs that we're featuring today always have that education component. So it's, it's really uh, important. Um, so one thing, you know, in the Smokies, we've been doing citizen science since 1998. And that is a, a, a quite a, a long time. It was not called citizen science, <laughs> at least that I knew of when we started doing it. And there also were not a lot of national projects. There were some projects like eBird and uh, you know the Christmas bird count, that type of thing. Not eBird, but the you know the bird counts and some stream monitoring that you could be part of, but not a whole lot online. And uh, so in the Smokies, we really had to think about what our goals were, what we wanted. And we realized that we needed to create our own citizen science project. So I'm going to talk a little bit about like 
when, if you're uh, someone who is a land manager or work for a nature center or even a schoolyard, you know, when do you um, create your own project versus joining in for, to another project? Um, one great thing about the projects that exist now is they're easy to use. They don't usually have a lot of specialized equipment. Um, they give you big global chunks of data. Uh, you can go out and repeat as you need, and that data is very easy to report. So that's one of the advantages of, of joining in uh, with a, a big, larger project. Um, in the Smokies, we really had projects that would be called long-term monitoring projects. They did not typically have a scientific question behind them, but our need to have data over time, over years was really important. So we looked at some of our critical issues in the park and that would be things like air pollution and its impact on resources or climate change or invasive exotic species. Um, and we match that with the uh, education needs of our community. So we looked at our teachers, our K through 12 teachers, especially middle school and high school, uh, what are their curriculum goals? And we matched up our needs for long-term monitoring with the needs of the education community. Um, for our projects, they did need specialized equipment. We needed uh, training for people to make good observations or at least having a ranger along to help uh, facilitate good observations. We're really focused narrowly in on Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Uh, we needed data repeated. Um, and at that point, when we first started, we didn't have a public database. Um, so you know, we were really just not really thinking about having our citizen science projects being part of um, you know, what somebody who was in New York could do, for instance. Uh, we were focused just on the schools around our park. Um, but we did transition, um, and I'll, I guess I'll get to that in just a second. So just very quickly, I'm going to go ahead to save time and just click through all these. And it's just a decision tree on you know, when do you create your own original project versus joining in with an established project. And really what it comes down to are how specific are your research goals. Um, and you know, if you really want it to be strongly curriculum based for a particular age group, uh, you know, sixth graders, for instance, then maybe, you know, you want to develop your own thing. And then control of sustainability. What I mean by that is we had a project where we were partnering with a group um, out of Kansas to do our lichen monitoring, and they were hosting our data online. And then they lost their funding and they went away. And I had no idea. And we lost um, about six years worth of data. So that, that was not fun. Um, so we wanted to now have control of our sustainability. And that's when we joined up with uh, uh, Hands on the Lamb, which is actually an organization. It's a, a, a collaborative, a consortium of, of um, federal land agencies. And we have a website and right now NEF, um, Robert's organization, uh, is the host of that. So our databases that we have now exist on hands on the land. Um, we are about to move them onto field scope, which is the next presentation. So you're gonna learn a little bit about the new host of um, our online databases um, from, uh, from Sean in the next presentation. So here are some of the projects that we have uh, hosted on hands on the land and soon to be hosted on field scope. Um, and some of these are set up so you could do, do these uh, have your own database for your particular site. So whether you're a, a schoolyard or whether you are a park um, or a nature center, you could do these same studies because we put all of our materials, our data sheets, um, the instruction manuals are all online. So it's different citizen science because we're not looking at your data, you are looking at your data. It's just an, an opportunity for a teacher uh, or an educator to track their data over time to replicate the same long-term monitoring, looking for change over time that we do in the Smokies. Um, so here, as I mentioned, that we have some of our materials, all of our materials were co-created with teachers and researchers. So when we create a new data sheet, I bring in uh, a scientist or two, I bring in the grade level we're targeting, middle school, high school teachers, um, and our park educators, and we develop 
the data sheet so it can be used easily by students. So on the left, you see a data sheet. On the right, you see a, uh, a terrestrial invertebrate order guide. And for me, one thing to point out on that data sheet, the most important data on that data sheet is not necessarily the critters that you see. It's things like percent of soil moisture, the soil pH, the soil temperature, the air temperature, and most importantly, today's date. Because if we don't know when the data was collected, it can't be long-term monitoring. It's not comparing change over time. But really what's important to us are what are conditions like um, on the ground when we're finding whatever we find. Are we finding a lot of snails? Is it really dry? Is it really wet? That type of information. So um, we have been doing these studies now since uh, most of them started in 2003. So we have this really nice robust database. What we have found is we have lost some species. Uh, we lost a tree called the Eastern Hemlock in some of the plots where we're doing this study. We now have a more extreme drought, we have more extreme wet years, and we can really look at that change over time. So it's become a really interesting data for the park to have this. Um, just real briefly, because I know I'm gonna run out of time shortly, just wanted to show some of the uh, community science that we do in the Smokies that we call crowdsourcing. And that's if, if you're coming to the park, you, we want you to help us collect data. And I do believe that these are on size starter. Uh, the Snap It and Map It, where we have 30 species that we need more data points for. They're typically easy to identify, not easily confused with other species. And once we have uh, 30 different uh, location points in the park, we can do a better job of mapping that uh, using our predictive GIS maps. Uh, another project called Otter Spotter, uh, which is uh, we reintroduced otter in Great Smoky Mountains National Park, but we want to see how far have they spread from the areas where we did the releases back in the late 1990s. So if you see otter or signs of otter when you're out hiking in the park, you can go into iNaturalist and do otter spotter. Uh, we also use this for cultural um, as well. So this is, project is a mix of natural, natural and cultural. Uh, with the Eastern Band of the Cherokee, we have a uh, river cane restoration. River cane is a, is a traditional artisan plant, and we've partnered with a group out of the, um, it's run by the tribe, the RT car, to do a restoration of river cane, and then students help plant, and then they also help monitor. Uh, and then that uh, resource is there for us to use as education and um, for the community to hopefully do this in areas around their streams as well. Um, I know I'm running out of time, so just wanted to point out um, National Phenology Network, Nature's Notebook. This is a study that we didn't create, but we use in our education program. So we do have a couple studies that are national. Nature's Notebook is national. They provide all the great materials and you can do tree phenology monitoring. We also do this with volunteers in the park. Um, wanted to give a shout out to a project that's going on right now with the Audubon um, called Climate Watch and there are two target bird species. Uh, so observations between May 15th and June 15th, anywhere they have uh, Eastern and Western bluebirds, uh, nuthatches, and they want to know where they're being seen in these windows and this repeats every single year. So it's a, just a, a project I want people to know about. Um, some of these resources you are hearing about, I know that these slides will be made available to you. Um, so just know that in my presentation, there are a couple resources for you. And then at the end, um, there will be time for questions and um, this beautiful photograph from a morning sunrise in the Smokies. So I hope you all have a great day. Thanks, Susan. I really liked how you pointed out that uh, some of these projects uh, can involve more than just science. Uh, and that's part of what uh, is the greening stem model at NEF uh, is bringing together different aspects of uh, subject matter uh, and uh, applying uh, a more holistic approach. Uh, and so really appreciate your boots on the ground perspective and uh, congratulate you on, on all of the great work that you've done. If you do have questions for Susan or other panelists, please feel free to submit them. You don't have to wait till the very end. 
And Susan mentioned that uh, the uh, website that Neef hosts, uh, Hands on the Land, is where she had been storing many of her project's uh, data. Uh, it, it, at some point it is going to sunset. And so she needed to find a new home and that she did. And that brings us to our next presenter, Sean O'Connor from, uh, from BSCS. And Sean's gonna tell us a little bit more about the platform that they have that supports citizen science. Yeah, great. It's, it's so nice to be here with, with everyone and hear from all the other presenters. Uh, it's been really inspiring, and I'm going to share a bit about FieldScope, which is a platform that we host and operate out of uh, of Science Ed, a nonprofit called BSCS Science Learning. And uh, uh, to do that, I'm actually going to start just with a quick little history. A lot of text here. I'll just give you the highlights. And I think it's interesting for the context today of what we're talking about. So we actually first developed FieldScope out of a university uh, where there was an original director of the project who kind of worked in computer sciences and education and was thinking a lot about how we engage learners in digital platforms to learn with data and learn about the world. And interestingly, we had done some sort of research and work with the GLOBE program at that time. And then that uh, platform, FieldScope, came over to the National Geographic Society, and that's kind of where I met up with it. So I've been involved with it for, for more than a decade, and National Geographic is in Washington, D.C. It's in a huge watershed region, the watershed of the Chesapeake Bay, and at that time, the health of the bay was really quite terrible, and there was a lot of partners across that watershed region who came together and wanted a better platform where classrooms and nature centers could all contribute water quality data. And so we, we sort of shaped the, the early tool around water quality studies there. And then we were sitting on this tool and we said, gee, we're pretty happy with this. And we think that we could extend it in a way that would allow other citizen science programs to, to easily come on board with it and launch their own project where you have data entry tools, and tools for allowing participants in a project to engage with data and study it and maps and graphs. And we got some funding from the National Science Foundation to do just that. And uh, about 2016, the tool left Nat Geo and it came over to BSES Science Learning. And last year was a big milestone year for FieldScope because we launched a brand new version of it that's mobile friendly and modernized and secure. And, and you know, we took that first decade of learning about what works well about the tool and what doesn't, and we were able to improve and enhance it. So that's what we launched last year. And today I just want to kind of go through three ways that you might engage with FieldScope. One is just joining a project that is already hosted on FieldScope. And then the second one, kind of the heart of this webinar is about how to launch your own project. And then I'm going to tell you about some resources where you can get students learning with data generated through citizen science projects on FieldScope. So around joining, uh, this is really just a selection of some of the projects that use FieldScope to sort of power their citizen science. And like we heard, we're, we're so excited that we're gonna get to kind of collaborate with Great Smokies on bringing some of their long-term monitoring citizen science into FieldScope. For your purposes today, I just wanted to highlight three that are really either national or international programs. Because the thing with FieldScope is sometimes you can use the tool to launch a really localized study, or you can use the tool as part of a big you know, worldwide study. And so there are some amphibian monitoring and plant phenology monitoring and night sky monitoring projects that do use FieldScope currently that you can get on board with. And then there are also a couple sort of regional wide uh, water quality projects that might be interesting to you too. The Chesapeake Bay watershed and the Great Lakes watershed are massive regions of the United States. So there's a good chance that um, at least part of the group here today falls into either one of those watersheds. So those may be interesting to you as well. So then let's talk about launching a project. And I'm Susan, I'm so glad you had that slide with sort of the decision tree of when do you join an existing project? And when do you launch a new one? I love that, and I want to I want to see that from you if, if you don't mind sharing, because I think it's a great frame to help people think about. 
do you really want to host and launch your own project on FieldScope? You might. There's there's a good reason to. Or is there something that is already out there in the world that you want to participate in? And I just wanted to call out SciStarter as, I mean, really, it's the place to go and find what citizen science projects are out there to get started with. But if you find yourself with sort of a unique study in your, in your community, in your region, and you do want to launch a project, FieldScope is designed for that. And so this just kind of shows you a quick schematic of what it looks like to launch a project in FieldScope. We try to make the, the process really simple for folks. Ultimately, you define, you use some spreadsheet templates to kind of define what fields you want people to enter data for. Are they numeric? Do you want people to select from lists? Do you want people to upload media as part of it? And you get to define your data form using a simple spreadsheet. And then we, uh, we are funded and supported to build that project for you. So it's pretty neat. Um, if you are interested, please reach out to me uh, and my team behind FieldScope. And then I just wanted to highlight learning with citizen science data. There's, there's all these great projects out in the world that have generated so many contributions from the public. And we have you know, a number of big projects on FieldScope. And of course, when you think about data in citizen science, see this on the left side says collecting and contributing data. That's maybe where you think of, right? I wanna get my students outside, you know, collecting tree height data, whatever else. But there's all these different ways of working with data, which can really add to someone's learning um, beyond just the collecting part through analyzing, visualizing, et cetera. And, you know, what a cool thing to be able to see your data and the personal contribution you've made in the context of a larger data set. That is globe at night data that is visualized on FieldScope and that screenshot there. So we actually have a set of 12 lessons online that are designed for middle and high school students that are all about having an experience of science inquiry with data generated through these projects. They all include an option to participate in the collecting, but they're really centered on, okay, we're in the classroom. We're actually gonna have this science experience working with data, which you know we've created these because we found there's sort of a, a dearth of that and re good resources available for working with authentic, real, live data sets. So that's what that set of resources is about. And from here, I just want to take you through a few slides of what the field scope tool looks like so you can get a better sense of, you know, if you are thinking about launching a project, what, what that means and what that looks like. So this on screen here is just a little screenshot of a field scope project page, uh, which is a very localized study. This is a, a community science project in partnership with uh, Coastal Fish Pond uh, in Hawaii and the schools in that area where students go out and they monitor the water quality and they work on um, stewardship projects, removing invasives. And then they actually use this field school project to report on their data. Uh, and here just kind of shows you, I'm gonna take you through what their data entry form looks like. Because if you wanted to launch a project on FieldScope, you'd actually define what you would want your data entry form to look like. So on any FieldScope project, typically you, you go in and you add your location. Maybe it's a new location where you, you click add station and you, you know, use the map and set your new lat and long. Or maybe there's an existing one because you're going back to monitor at a site where you've monitored before. Then you go through and you add, you know, your date, like Susan said, you got to add the date so we know when that data is coming from, and then whatever else is defined by the project. So in this case, they're having people collect data on time, on the depth of the observation, on some of these water quality parameters that they use, they mostly use um, PASCO water sensors for. And then they also have people upload media of what their, their study site looks like through photos. Um, the data entry forms are mobile friendly. This is a, a project that uses FieldScope, which is all about recreational divers off the coast of California doing reportings on um, sharks that they photograph. So it's a really niche audience, but I just wanted to show you how in any project you can explore data on a map, in tables, data is always downloadable. If data has media associated with it, you can kind of blow that up and explore it. Um, Kind of hearkening to Jessica's presentation, this is a map of land cover data. So you can imagine when you're studying water quality, it makes it all the richer to be able to 
understand what the land use is around that study site. So that's something I would say pretty special about FieldScope is we allow projects to pull in these GIS map layers so that you can add important context to data. So this is land cover data that is created from satellites as we were talking about earlier. Um, you can filter data. So FrogWatch is an amphibian monitoring project that's huge. There's over 150,000 observations from folks. And so this is just showing a part of the tool where anyone using it can say, hey, I don't wanna look at all the frog data. I just wanna look at green frogs. And you know, here I've created a filter set for green frogs and another filter set for American toads. And then when you create these slices of data, you can choose different kinds of data displays to visualize it in. Um, so all these tools are both in the hands of students and people participating, but also you know, projects create their own data dashboards using these tools, which are usually a nice entryway for folks to get into the data. Um, this is just another map. This is from the Chesapeake Water Quality Project showing salinity data. Um, so the darker blues mean it's closer to ocean water. The pinks are it's closer to fresh water. So being able to you know, find yourself in that data, whatever your salinity was, and understand the larger patterns with salinity in that area. Um, and a bar graph that's showing my American toads and what month they were calling in versus my green frogs. So you can start to see the differences of when different kinds of amphibians were calling. Frog watch, I didn't mention, is a, a listening protocol where you're, you're reporting on frog calls. And whatever you create, if you're a student, a teacher, or the, the you know, person behind the project, you can save it out as a data dashboard that is shareable with others. And here's just showing, you know, for me in Frog Watch, you know, my list of visualizations that I've created. On top, these are what the project has created. On the bottom are ones I've created. And yeah, later this year, we're continuing to evolve field scope. We actually mentioned in the Q&A something we're working on, these teacher facilitated accounts to facilitate students entering data without having to create their own logins. Lots of other fun things we're working on, like animating our data with change over time and maps. So a lot more fun stuff to come. Uh, and I just want to wish everyone a happy EE week, a happy Earth month, a happy Sitsai month. And April really is a pretty fantastic month. And just our information on how to get in touch is up there. So thank you. Thanks, Sean. You know, I've, I've been around long enough that I used to um, do this kind of work with my students and we just used an Excel spreadsheet and then would generate some graphs. And, and so things have come a long way. But I think at the heart of some of this is the notion of what are the students going to get out of it? And how, how do you make sure that you have quality engagement? And we know that if the students believe that the work that they're doing has value, that they're contributing to something that's larger than themselves, this scientific research or trying to find the answer to a, a research question that um, it really does make a difference. And so if anyone out there, uh, any of our viewers today have questions, uh, please feel free to ask them. Uh, I do, did have one submitted uh, earlier by someone who registered, uh, Julie Seymour. And Julie asks, what are the goals and major components of a quality citizen science project. So if you would all please uh, share your thoughts on that. I can jump in really quick because I also think we can kind of combine that with another question I saw come through the Q&A about um, involving students in citizen science projects and all the logistics about submitting data and things like that. Um, so I think a quality citizen science project thinks through that question. It thinks through the actual um, specifics of how people will interact with our interface, how they're going to get the data to us, and also designing for learning. I really like the uh, National Academies report about that, about how the, some of the best projects have learning outcomes embedded in the project. I think GLOBE is a, an all-star example of that. Every time I do GLOBE clouds, um, I learn something new about clouds. Um, not only, you know, how to identify them and what types of clouds are what, but also, um, you know, different things about how satellites work. So I think a good project uh, designs for learning um, and also is th thoughtful about their interface and how people submit data and also thinks through, especially if they're engaging students, 
thinks through how the, all the different privacy concerns and how students can meaningfully engage. But um, what do you all think? What, what makes a good project? I'll, I'll jump in just to, to give a short answer, which is to say engagement um, and, and to sort of second everything Caroline said and say, when you're designing it, really be thoughtful about how you're committed to communicating back with your members because the, the, the experience of the people participating, whether it's classrooms or whoever, is just enriched, enhanced, given more legs and sustainability when you've really thought through that communications plan of how you're going to communicate results back and all that. So just think of engagement. Yeah, and the, the only thing I would add is, um, you know, echoing everything that was just said is evaluation as well. You know, how is it meeting the needs of your scientists? Is it meeting the needs of your, your audiences, whether that's teachers or youth um, and uh, all of everything else? Yeah, and, and I'll add um, from the really student-centric position, um, GLOBE was a really important part of me becoming a scientist in, in myself, identifying myself as a scientist, right? And growing that confidence in all of those skills and being able to see myself as a scientist. So in terms of implementing citizen science, particularly with students, I think that part is really important for students to be able to see themselves as scientists and see that those skills as a scientist are improving and that they're getting to practice those skills by doing the activity themselves. Great. Uh, did we have any other questions come in? Uh, are there any other questions for our panelists? Um, I think I don't see any other specific questions per se, but. I have a question, if you don't mind that being kind of our final question in our last four minutes, Robert. No, not at all. Great. Um, so I know we have a lot, kind of a lot of folks who are educators on the line. And I was wondering if you all could speak to educators who might also be designing their own citizen science projects. If you have any advice for them about how to work with existing platforms, just from like the educator's perspective, like someone actively working with learners. So I, I'm happy to share a little bit from, um, you know, the years of training teachers, I would say it's okay to start small. Um, this is coming from someone who's works with the GLOBE program, over 50 different protocols. It, it can be overwhelming, right? And thinking through all of these different platforms. And so uh, the teachers who have been a little nervous to try, when we talk to them about really making it manageable and starting out small, that really helps, right? And so come up with your goal to say, um, maybe if you're still doing remote, right? Like this one week, we're gonna do science observations, even if it's just in a science notebook. Maybe we haven't made it all the way yet to the interface of the app or the data entry site, right? But starting to practice those skills. Um, and, and like I said, starting out small with all of the many things that are included in field activities from a safety perspective, as well as the trying to make scientific value of it perspective. Um, and know that there are a lot of people in this community who are willing to help. Yeah, and I would say, you know, along those same lines, just do it. Um, there are a lot of people who are doing citizen science. So, you know, I know a lot of teachers who take their students out to do stream monitoring, but they don't keep the data. If you just kept that data from year to year to year, you can do a comparative study after two or three years. And, uh, or you can go and see, you know, uh, into a field scope and see, well, what are they finding in these areas that are partnered with the Chesapeake Bay? And how does it compare to what we're finding? So even if you don't submit your data, you can still track your data and, and have a meaningful scientific experiment. Uh, so that's what I always try to get teachers to do is just keep the data you collect with your students and look at it. It's, it's beautiful data. Use it. Yeah, I, um, I, those are great answers and maybe kind of just adding to what Jessica was saying. Um, I always, you know, practicing skills, absolutely getting out there, trying it. 
I'm a huge iNaturalist fan. I love it just for my own uh, naturalist observations. And I think if you are ready to go to that sort of tool level and have your data be part of a community, iNat or their companion app Seek for kids are great, like kind of first entryways into like a big general study that's happening out in the world of biodiversity monitoring. I think this, that's a perfect note to end on, I think. We have some pretty good questions. Uh, Robert, do you have any other closing words for us before we go? I do, and it's unfortunate that our time today for this webinar is up, uh, but it's so good to hear what uh, you all are talking about and doing with, with citizen science. Uh, using uh, the environment as context for STEM learning is at the heart of what we're trying to uh, promote at NEF. Uh, so I want to thank you all and those of you who tuned in today. Um, we hope that you're inspired to incorporate citizen science into your toolkit of educational resources. I uh, hope to see some of you again Wednesday at one for our next EE Week webinar, Developing Greening STEM Activities for the Classroom. And if you can't tune in on Wednesday, you can find all of these things at nefusa.org. So once again, thank you, everyone. And uh, Happy EE -E week. Bye, everybody.